okay? Is it okay? I don't know. Better? Is it? Okay. Mm. Ah, maybe. I don't know. Or I just, ah, okay, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> All right. So we start. Hi, uh, so this is uh, basically uh, working uh, on uh, different, cl different classes of models which can uh, provide a strong first order phase transition, which is one of the criteria uh, to get baryogenesis, and then trying to see if these models can, uh, you know, if using the colliders, you can extract, you know, the Higgs of couplings for these class of models. And this is work done uh, with my collaborators from Korea, Minho Son and Sung Jun Lee. Okay. So, well, we know the Higgs mass, we know the Higgs web, we understand a, few, uh, a lot more uh, collider properties of the Higgs, but we have no idea of how the Higgs potential really looks like. We have no idea what the shape of the Higgs potential really is. So what I'm talking about is if I were to write the Higgs potential in, uh, you know, uh, in this form, or you know, if which is somehow similar to what you usually see for standard models, but I have reparameterized it to uh, introduce these uh, uh, coefficients C3 and D3, which are basically what would encapsulate any deviation from the standard model. And for the standard model, we know that these are one but we do not know if the standard model is really valid at high temperatures or higher energies. So a measurement of these uh, couplings is needed to test the validity of the standard model. So in, uh, in other words, we only know what the local properties of Higgs are. We do not really understand what the global picture of it looks like. So if you go away from the minimum of the Higgs potential, what happens? How does the shape look? So to answer this question, uh, there are different ways of looking at it. First, we try to measure the Higgs of coupling at the colliders. Now, this measurement is uh, quite a non-trivial thing. Uh, you could do uh, the reason being, firstly, uh, you know, uh, the cross sections are very small. The branching ratios for the specific channel that looks the cleanest is also very less. So usually, uh, in standard model, you look for multi-Higgs production via the gluon fusion, okay? And uh, the usual uh, diagrams that we encounter is the triangle diagram, where you have the Higgs cubic coupling sitting here, and then you have the Tokyo This diagram interferes negatively with this box diagram. And this because happens because, uh, of the, uh, because the, the Higgs propaga propagator has an off-shell uh, it has an offshore contribution, and that causes a lot of suppression. And it, it ends up that, you know, you have a very, very small signal rate at the 14 TV collider. So let's look at what we have for, you know, the future high-energy electric collider. And the future limits, uh, which, are proposed, which we had, like, in 2015, 14, uh, showed that eventually, if you look at uh, BB bar gamma gamma final states, which would have a branching ratio of about 0.264%, you would be seeing only 10 events at the high luminosity LHC. So it's pretty bad. But there are ways in which at least you can exclude what region of uh, the cubic, uh, uh, Higgs cubic uh, deviations would be, you know, excluded. Recently, Atlas put out a few more results where they were able to narrow down this uh, exclusion limits to the region between 3 to 5 at two sigma levels. At 100 TV, things look slightly more promising uh, because uh, you get a quite a 40 times enhancement. And uh, at, at itself, like 30 at to one inverse, you see like, you know, there can be deviations around, you know, the precision is better. You can have 2.4 percent uh, deviations. It's even better at the ILC, where you can have deviations about 10 percent. Then what about the quartic coupling? That's even crazier to think about. 
But let's look at uh, what the future prospects for it look like. Uh, this is a plot uh, in the quartic versus cubic plane. And uh, what I'm trying to show here is that if, if, if the cubic deviations are like in the negative region, then you can really, if, y if, you, if the models have deviations in this region, then you can really rule it out very quickly. If, if you have, say, no deviation in the Higgs cubic, then, you know, there, there's a, uh, the quartic can really vary a lot. On the other hand, if you have even some like order one uh, uh, deviations in uh, the cubic coupling, then also you could, you, you know, there's still a range in which the quartic can lie. Of course, this is very, very large, then the deviations become in the quartic become lesser. So if you have order one uh, deviations, then a 100 TV collider can be very useful. And uh, this is a similar picture, which, uh, in a way shows the same thing, but this is done for the higher uh, luminosity LHC. So in principle, if you see deviations in the cubic, there are ways to constrain uh, the, the class of models you would have, which would have deviations in the quartic. All right, so let's look at what the Higgs effects of potential look like. Uh, at a finite temperature, because I'm also interested in uh, focusing on models which have a strong first order phase transition. So to look at any phase, uh, electroweak phase transition, one has to look at the Higgs potential at finite temperature. When I say that, you want to go beyond what you s usually use for the, uh, for the zero temperature, just where you have just the Higgs mass, Higgs uh, cubic, quartic pieces. Now you have to enhance and heat up the system, go at higher temperatures. When you do that, what happens is you, uh, you get contributions from uh, the, the Higgs, uh, the all the masses they get some thermal contributions, and uh, there are further more contributions coming from the hot plasma that you have. And this would be, uh, so you would have contributions coming from the bosons, so your WZ and even top. These would give you the maximum contributions. So in a way, you can parameterize this in the following form, where uh, the first term here, uh, dt square, basically encodes the thermal mass. T naught square uh, d times t is your usual Higgs mass parameter, mu square. Then you have the Higgs quartic. And you can, because of finite temperature or some non-BSM effects, you could also get a Higgs cubic piece. Now this is one of the most important pieces because this is what triggers the phase transition. So in standard model, this uh, small e is actually zero, while in mo a lot of uh, BSM scenarios, like just if you take standard model plus singlet or higher dimensional, sorry, well, let's go there, or uh, any high dimensional operators, then you can also have a non-zero e. And the capital E is usually generated at loop level. So when you include uh, finite temperature uh, co loop contributions, then you get uh, terms which are linear in T. And eventually, it's basically uh, a fight between these two, para uh, these two coefficients, which decides what the nature of electroweak phase transition would look like. If you have a second order phase transition, or a crossover, which is what we see in the standard model, then both uh, both of these terms are zero. A first order phase transition occurs when either one of them at least is not zero. And it's the first order phase transition which has interesting uh, uh, consequences which can be observed. For instance, barogenesis. So uh, I'll just again show you exactly what happens in the standard model. Because I said it's a first order phase transition, so it's just a smooth rollover of the field uh, five, the background field, uh, and it, it just smoothly rolls over from a uh, high temperature to a low temperature, and uh, these transitions are always in thermal equilibrium, and so the system has no information of what happened in the unbroken phase, and so it becomes cosmologically interesting. We can never uh, extract any useful information of what happened in the past. And for the stand model, it has been shown in several papers that this would be the case because of what the Higgs mass now is. However, if you go back, uh, go to beyond, go beyond the standard model, then things become more interesting. And uh, what happens is that you know the phi now actually 
has a has a transition such that you know uh, it, it it has a first order. There's a barrier in between, and it trans transitions from say the high temperature to the low temperature after crossing this barrier. And uh, so the this field phi has to tunnel through the, to get to the true vacuum. And this is the out of equilibrium process, and this is what becomes relevant for cosmology. So in general, we can um, it it's a it's you know the the requirement for to get a, a first out of phase transition or in general for this any kind of effective potential to get a phase transition you can classify the uh, most of the known uh, bsm models into the three following categories so the first one is thermally driven where you, if where you would have say some new degrees of freedom in the early universe and you can have this variation barrier formation either from the thermal loops, which would be associated with light scalars, which would ha be coming from these cubic thermal cubic field terms, or you could have heavy particles, which have large couplings to the Higgs. Alternatively, you could also have three level driven uh, scenarios, where you could have some renormalizable or non-renormalizable operators. Uh, uh, high adding high dimensional operators, like a dimension six operator is a very well known kind of and then you can also have loop-driven uh, phase transitions, where you would have, say, for instance, some quartic correction of the form H4 ln square, and this would compete with the unstable H, the quartic piece that you have in the Sun model, and that would trigger a phase transition. So, in other words, uh, in other ways, you can, uh, you know, visualize these four scenarios uh, in the following way. So I specifically just uh, listed the renormalizable, non-renormalizable in two different categories here. So you have uh, this thermally driven scenario, uh, which is also called the Bose-Einstein con condensate scenario because it's the uh, it's usually the uh, your bosonic loops which is giving you a uh, phase transition. And so in this case, it's the finite temperature of physics which becomes very important. So you need to have a very precise uh, precise computations for the thermal field theory. Uh, the SAN model uh, plus singlet, or which is your Higgs portal scenario, falls in this category. And uh, so I in this case, we, if you investigate further, you can understand whether you know, your uh, high temperature uh, potential is really valid or not. So this will be a uh, focus of my study for the first half. And then later on, we would look at non-renormalizable operators. Okay, so well, we know that there is evidence from cosmology for baryogenesis. We know that the baryon to photon ratio, even though it's small, but it still is, uh, it has been well measured by Planck. And to, to get baryogenesis, we, uh, we already know what the three criteria are. We require baryon number violation, out of equilibrium, uh, decay, and uh, C and C, charge parity violation. So our focus is mostly on out of equilibrium decays because we want to make sure that models have out of equilibrium decays. Then, uh, of course, as I said before, uh, you cannot have a first out of phase transition in a standard model. So by that, by saying that, you cannot have an out of equilibrium decay, and also the charge QP violation is fairly small. So standard model is obviously not a good candidate to uh, explain electroweak biogenesis. Now, uh, what is the criteria for baryon number violation, or also to make sure you get an out of equilibrium decay? Uh, the baryon numbers uh, is can be usually violated by non-perturbative electroweak processes, which are usually uh, you can write them as unstable solutions of the effective action, uh, for the which is basically the scalarons, which intercalate between the topologically distinct vacuoids. So you come from your fa false uh, unbroken vacua to your uh, true vacuum, which is the broken state that we are in now. The scalaron energy usually depends, because it depends on the effect of action, in, in turn it, affects, uh, it depends on the shape of the potential, which is uh, the global shape, so away from the minimum. So this is a very good test to understand the uh, global structure of the Higgs potential. And uh, for a successful electroweak baryogenesis, you need to make sure that these electroweak scaleron processes are out of equilibrium in a broken phase. 
and this is usually characterized by this washout avoidance condition, which says that the web, uh, the Higgs web, at the transition um, phase transition temperature divided by the phase transition temperature should be greater than the following number, where E, e sphaleron is the energy of the sphaleron at zero temperature. And 9 TV is what it is approximately it takes the value for the standard model. So uh, this is not a very well calculated number for most DSM theories, and there are several reasons for why that happens. But usually, uh, whenever uh, we study baryogenesis of DSM model, we usually focus on the following range. Uh, so V over T lying between 0.6 to 1.4 to say that it is a strong first order phase transition. So this is our criteria to have a strong first order phase transition. There's no unique value that it has, and this adds to, and it eventually translates to, you know, to uncertainty in the measurement of the Higgs coupling, or the whatever it would predict. So as I already said before, I, I because it is tied to the Higgs self couplings, you can uh, test uh, these models of baryogenesis at the LSE, at the future uh, colliders, and also uh, if it's a very strong uh, first order phase transition, then it would trigger some stochastic gravitational waves. And so you could see them at future uh, gravitational wave experiments also. All right, so let's look at what the effective potential really looks like. So uh, I will be following two different kinds of prescriptions to, uh, to basically highlight the fact that it is very important to understand uh, the thermal field theory in these scenarios. Uh, the first case is uh, what we call the, effect, uh, the truncated full dressing, where the thermal mass is obtained with a high temperature approximation. So uh, the effective potential here is the tree level, the Coleman-Weinberg piece, where you have the zero, uh, the zero temperature mass, and then there are the thermal corrections, and then you have the finite temperature piece. Where the finite temperature uh, piece can be actually written in terms of this exact integral, it's an exponentiated, and uh, here Fi basically is zero or one, depending if you're talking about fermions or bosons, and Gi is the number of degrees of freedom, and uh, this is again uh, the thermal mass which needs to be calculated properly. So uh, if you have, uh, in principle, you should be doing this exact integral. And uh, usually this is not done. There are several ways in which you make approximations. And one of the possible ways to make approximation is to expand this finite temperature piece uh, at high temperatures, which means in the limit where m squared over t, t squared is much, much less than 1. Then this uh, this becomes this reduces to uh, these series uh, terms for the bosons and fermions, and uh, you can use these. And it, it has this uh, x cube piece, which is your t cube piece, which basically uh, uh, sorry, this gives you the first order phase transition. Now going back to prescription, uh, so this prescription where you expand in high temperature is what the prescription A is. So you expand only the finite temperature piece. Uh, for taking the high temperature limit. Going back to prescription A, uh, where you had the exact integral, we found that if you, if you actually do a low temperature expansion, then you end up with uh, the following kind of terms, which is basically Bessel, uh, this, this is a series of Bessel functions. And if you use these uh, and sum up to a very high order, they uh, match uh, the exact integral fairly well. And so we decided to call this actually the prescription A where we use the low temperature approximation, which is matching fairly well to the exact temperature calculations. So this just uh, is done for uh, to do uh, computations really fast. There's no other reason. In principle, you could do the exact integrals also. So uh, what are the benchmark scenarios we look at? The first, uh, the usually, you know, in BSM, we uh, you can have enforced Z to symmetry uh, with a for a new singlet that is added. You could increase the number of multiplicities. So you can have more sing uh, scalars in theory. Uh, this can help in, uh, by this can help you in getting a smaller coupling. You can have effective field theoretical scenarios where you can have, uh, again, a weakly coupled theory or a strongly coupled theory. 
where you could add uh, dimensions, uh, higher dimensional operators of these forms. And then if you have a strongly coupled theory, again, you can have whether uh, you can decide whether you take a PGD or a non-zero Goldstein uh, scenario. So first we look at the Higgs portal, which falls in the category where you have a thermally driven first order phase transition. And uh, so we start with a standard model plus a singlet. So you uh, add uh, interaction of the Higgs with the singlet, and then you have the uh, the bare Higgs mass and also the quartic term here. Here we have imposed a Z2 symmetry, so it reduces the number of terms that you could have for the singlet. Now, uh, we use the prescriptions, prescription A and B that I told you about before, and uh, using them, we calculate what the effective potential would look like. Once we have the effective potential, we scan for its minimum and extract what its critical parameters, uh, the critical wave and the critical temperature would be at the phase transition. And we, we ask for all, uh, we use this naive criteria when VC over TC is greater than one, we define that as a strong first order phase transition. And we look for the whole parameter space where you would have these uh, first order phase transitions. Now there are two ways in which this first order phase transition can happen. It can be a one step first order phase transition, which is uh, this region um, in red, where what happens is the, uh, the singlet never get, uh, acquires mass, uh, it, uh, uh, it never acquires a web, and it's only the Higgs which acquires a web as the phase transition proceeds. So in this scenario, we, we basically see that it's only this particular red shaded region of this whole parameter space uh, of, the, of this particular model where you can uh, have a strong first order phase transition. It's a fairly small area. Then you could also have a two-step strong first order phase transition. By that I mean that initially you were in a state where both the Higgs and the singlet had zero webs. Then the singlet acquires a web and then later on, the Higgs acquires a web. In this scenario, we end up in uh, this green band where we have also put an additional constraint that the quartic should lie between zero to five. This, war, this is our like, definition of what, what is allowed by Porter Dickerson. In principle, by NDA values, you could go to as far l large as four pi, but that really seems a very large number. So these are the only these are the only two regions where you can have first order phase transition. Then uh, there are a few more things. If you look at uh, there, because here we use a definition where V C over T C is greater than one. In other words, you could also look at what the bubble nucleation temperatures would be like because eventually you would have a, a the the true vacuum and the false vacuum. Uh, the false vacuum has a bubble which are nucleating and be becoming eventually the uh, the, the true vacuum and the, the temperatures at which that happens is a nucleation temperature which is usually slightly different from the critical temperature and if that definition is used then you get a slightly different picture and we uh, what was shown in this paper was that even the, the this green band itself gets very fine-tuned so, uh, so the two-step phase transition is a fairly fine-tuned area and for most of our study, we only focus on this one-step phase transition. So, so, so far, we only looked at the area where you can have a first order phase transition. Now, if you take this uh, uh, reasonable area and look at what the Higgs uh, couplings would look like, then uh, if, you, if you basically make a plot of VC over TC versus the cubic couplings, for both the prescriptions, prescription A and B. Uh, prescription A is where you have the exact temperature, and this is where you have the high temperature limit for the potential. What we see is that depending on what your VC over TC criteria is, your, pres uh, your precision of the Higgs self-coupling, which is this leftmost region, it changes rapidly. If I say my VC over TC should be greater than 0.6, then I'm talking about precision level of 5% needed to actually be able to observe any deviations. If I say it's around one, then it's 10% deviations. And if I say it's around 1.4, then it is around 30% deviations that can be seen. So uh, 
if, if we just focus on, say, order 1, Vc over Tc is 1, then itself you have uh, pretty high deviations which should be uh, observable at 100 TV collider. So to sum up, depending on what your criteria is for Vc over Tc, the target precision can fluctuate a lot. Now, uh, the other aspect that we noticed was the validity of the high tension approximation. So if, if you look at just the free energy of the boson, so the W, Z, or even just the Higgs or singlet, then uh, we saw that you know, the high temperature limit, it really is a very bad approximation for M over T already going around, say, 2, anything beyond 2 or beyond 3, actually. So this is, these are usually the values at which the electroweak uh, phase transition happens. So, uh, which is why if you look at these uh, plots of the masses of the singlet divided by the critical temperatures versus the cubic couplings, then we see quite a variation in between the two prescriptions. Another issue that we have here is uh, with regard to uh, perturbativity, because we are uh, looking at larger couplings of uh, uh, of the mixing of the Higgs with the singlet, and also the uh, because of that, we need to be able to, uh, we need to resum these uh, ring diagrams quite properly, and uh, if you resum them appropriately, you should be able to calculate the thermal mass correctly, and this has been done by uh, Curtin, Mead, and Mani, and. Uh, you need to solve a series of partial differential equations recursively to be able to compute this. However, this is still not very well implemented for BSM scenarios. So this is one of the two do things uh, that should be done eventually. Now, uh, if we look at uh, the two prescriptions, you know, prescription A and B, and if you just look at what the model space looks like, it almost looks identical. However, if you look into the details, like uh, if you look at the pl uh, of the plots of the critical temperature versus the critical well, then the prescription A and B look very different. In fact, uh, in prescription B, you're actually going to values of Vc, which are way beyond what uh, the Higgs value is at zero temperature. So this, uh, this sort of becomes very nonsensical. Moreover, if you look at uh, the plots of Vc over Tc, the criteria versus the singlet bare mass, then uh, we see that if you're looking at a high temperature approximation, then there should be a decoupling at happening at higher temperatures, but that doesn't happen. And this uh, is probably what eventually leads to uh, you know, incorrect results regarding the precision of the cubic couplings for the prescription B. So th this basically severely affects the precision that we have. So this is again another failure of the high temperature approximation. Now uh, he here uh, we basically show the cubic versus aquatic plane for the BSM, uh, for the stand model plus singlet scenario. And what we see here is that uh, you can have significant uh, deviations from the stand model for this scenario. And uh, usually the quartic uh, is like, uh, the deviation in the quartic is almost twice that of deviations in the cubic. The second uh, benchmark model that we focus on is uh, when you have high dimensional operators. So uh, to begin with, you can have the uh, NF EFT theory where you have usual standard model piece and then you have a dimension six operator. And so if you go in, uh, if once the Higgs acquires a web, and then, uh, then you can uh, eventually extract what the Higgs mass would look like. You can define what your Higgs web would be. And uh, eventually, you can parameterize what your cubic and quartic couplings would be in terms of this coefficient C6. And what we see is, again, that you know, the deviations in the quartic can be larger than that of the cubic. It's always possible to just include, so this, is, uh, this was just a zero temperature. If in the finite temperature, instead of in introducing the whole finite temperature contribution, if you just introduce only the T squared terms as a thermal effect, then uh, you can easily have an analytical solution and you can extract what your critical wave and critical temperatures would look like. And this basically uh, forces us uh, into 
having into like putting limits on what the value of C, uh, C6, the coefficient, should be if you want a strong first order phase transition. There's also uh, another way of looking at this. If you resum all the higher dimensional operators, so instead of going writing only a dimension six, you encode all possible, the whole infinite uh, uh, series of all these high dimensional operators. And uh, if you assume that these uh, are all universal and you can write them in the following form, then it's easier to extract what the cubic and quartic couplings would look like. So, uh, so in general, for dimension six, these are the three classes, subclasses that we look at. So, with this, uh, with this class of potential, also we repeat the same exercise. We again ask for uh, the the criteria of strong first order phase transition to be satisfied, and then we again look at what uh, the cup, uh, the deviation of the cubic versus the quartic would look like on this plane. So, this is. Uh, here you have all the different four types of models. You have the stand model, the singlet, which is the red region. So there the are very less deviations in this. Then you have the whole the higher dimensional operators, the three different classes. The black one is um, when you have just the dimension six operator. The box, the, uh, the purple box here is when you ask for only the thermal contributions added to the dimension six operator. And then this is when you have the infinite series of dimension six operators, and the green one is when you take a particular limit, which is almost like a technicolor limit. So what we see is uh, that for high dimensional operators, you can have far uh, significantly larger deviations as compared to uh, the sand model plus singlet scenario. So if, if, if we are able to measure, say, the cubic coupling at the future colliders, and then we, s we, we can ask questions about, uh, and if we have some sensitivity for the quartic, then we are able to like exclude different classes of models. So uh, I guess with this, I can sum up already. That's far. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. Yeah, to sum up, what we saw was uh, the various PSM scenarios can appear in different islands of the cubic versus quartic plane. The quartic could be important to distinguish the different scenarios, and it has a chance at a 100 TeV collider. Then uh, we also saw that uh, specifically when we looked at the stand model plus singlet scenario, that it raises important questions about the validity of perturbation, the validity of finite temperature, approximations that are made, and this basically uh, decides what the precision of these self-couplings would be. And the breakdown of the high temperature approximation is also far more pronounced in a two-step strong first order phase, phase transition. And this two-step first order phase transition is uh, quite important if we're looking for gravitational wave signals. And of course, we need to uh, narrow down and understand uh, and have a, a consistent way of calculating the criteria for strong first order phase transition. And if we observe any hint of say a strong first order phase transition, we could also uh, figure out you know, if it's a strongly coupled dynamics because in, in most of the scenarios that we had, we were having very large couplings. And uh, lastly, of course, if you have a strong electroweak phase transition, then you could see gravitational wave signals. So basically, you have the future colliders and future gravitational wave directors, uh, uh, detectors, and the future looks really, really bright. Thank you.